So, so a little, little bit about me. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me. I was groomed from an early age to be a supermodel, as you can tell. <laughs> so this is kind of the iterations of my life and my, up until my first job. And so, you know, I was growing, and everybody's telling me how handsome I was and debonair and all of that stuff starting in the third grade. Uh, I got a job at the Omaha World Herald, which is our newspaper. It's pretty much my first job that I ever had. And it was, uh, first it was in circulation, so, and you would not believe how evil people are when they miss their newspaper. And they call you up, they cuss you out, and you say, I got it taken care of. But then I moved into the classified ads. So then you would call me up, and I would type in the ads. And so I was going through, this is like my senior pick, and I, as you can see, I had all the babes. Uh, and then I ended up here. And, and so my career as a supermodel came crashing down really fast when they said, hey, Dell, we need a live body to do a shoot for McDonald's. So anytime you get called a live body, it kind of dashes a lot of your expectations, right? And so that kind of led me on a journey uh, of self-discovery, if you will, to what am I really about? Now, Andy mentioned me and him both went to the same high school. We went to Omaha North High, uh, which is the best high school in the United States of America, by the way. Um, and you know, when I was going through that, that's actually when I started kind of what we would call traditional community development work. So I'm about 30 years in the game right now. And so about 30 years into some kind of community development work, about 20 years into entrepreneurship work, and about eight years into ecosystem work, as long as I've been at the Federal Reserve Bank. And I guess, you know, since we're keeping with the Beyonce theme, you could kind of say I put a ring on it. I'd be careful. I don't want to flip you off, right? So <laughs> we're on the stage. And so this has been a tremendous journey. Um, for how many of you have been to Omaha? So, oh, good. Good for you. How many of you have been to anywhere in Nebraska? So the number one question as a black guy that I get is, are there really black people in Nebraska? The second most question that I get, do you still drive horses and buggies in Nebraska? And the reality is, is that honestly, Nebraska has, especially Omaha, it has 13% of their entire population is African American, so reflective of the national average. So it's no unsubstantial you know, number. And in a few years, we're going to be up over a million MSA. So that's not a substantial population, uh, insubstantial population number either. Now, once you think of Omaha, most people kind of think of the big picture things, right? Like if you would have went through the recession, I remember we were talking to people, like going through the recession 27, 2007, 2008, and beyond, people would say, you know, if people in Omaha and Nebraska would have turned off the TV, we'd have never even known it was happening. You know, you look at kind of like a high, a low cost of living, an increasing, you know, real wage rate. Uh, if you look at our, you know, chamber website, all the things are top 10 in, like people don't recognize we're becoming a fast tech hub. Um, a top 10 place to, to raise your family, all of these different things. A couple of people that you may know, for example, is Warren Buffett. We recently had the Berkshire Hathaway Conference there. That's his home. He still um, hangs around. We're noted for our philanthropy, way above national average in terms of giving and philanthropic support. All of these different things. And per capita-wise, we have more per capita Fortune 500 companies than anywhere else in the nation. So by any metric, when you look at the big picture data, what you're looking at is a city that's growing, it's strong, it's healthy, and it's thriving. But the reality is this for my community. So I grew up in a neighborhood called North Omaha, which is our predominant black community. For a long time, 60% of the entire black population in Nebraska lived in my zip code, 68111. Remember, that's 13%. So you got a high density population. For the longest, we were the only majority minority um, zip code in that entire uh, state. You know, it's recently changed as our Hispanic population has grown. And I remember vividly when a newspaper article came out citing a 2007 Pew Report right here. And it was called, World Herald did an article series called Poverty Amidst Prosperity. And in that, what they found in the Pew Research Report is something you may not expect, especially those of you from bigger metropolises. And what they found was that Omaha had the number one childhood poverty rate in the nation for African Americans and the number three adult poverty rate for African Americans. Raise your hand if you would have thought that about Omaha. You wouldn't have think that. You think about like, my, parent, my parents came up in St. Louis, and of course in East St. Louis, when you're driving East St. Louis, you can kind of see the husk, the hollowing out of the industrial you know, situation there, and you can kind of say, okay, if you would have said East St. Louis, I would get it. Maybe if you would say a, another place with high density, maybe in the South, you would say, you know, I'd probably get that, but Omaha, Nebraska? Warren Buffett? 
I can walk into the room literally, and I have what, multiple billionaires in the same room talking about how do we improve our community. Where else can you find that? And still in this place, it's called, well, I've been calling it a tale of two cities. So if you remember the tale of two cities, you know that book that we all hated to read, but they made us read in high school. How many of you read it, and how many of you enjoyed it? Well, which one of you read it, and which one of you enjoyed it? <laughs> we had one person that enjoyed it out of all the people that read it. But basically, it's a story of the French Revolution. And it was a story of the French Revolution as the underclass of individuals got so frustrated with the proletariat or the bourgeois, or whatever you want to call it, that they said, we're not going to have this anymore. And so as I've given various iterations of this conversation over the past eight years, I really classify Omaha as a tale of two cities, and we're not the only one. We're not the only one. You can, I bet if I, I gave you a shot and say, hey, identify a black community or a Hispanic community or a different kind of community in a rural environment that is really struggling, even though the city or the state is doing really well, you could probably all shout it out, right? We're not the only one. So you have many tales of two cities, tales of two states in the, in the case of our rural. You know, I spent 50% of my time when I started the Fed doing work in rural. So now the question becomes if a city like Omaha can be as astoundingly awesome as it is at the macro level with so many billionaires, so many Fortune 500 companies, all of this energy around it, all of these uh, commendations for how great it is, how in the world can you have 13% of the population in abject poverty in that same city? And I submit to you that it's an economic development problem that requires new models of economic development. And that's why you are so important to me. Because as ecosystem builders, you are the evolution of economic development. And what you do and what we are trying to do, both as individuals and together, has the power, and I mean this with, oh, I'm sorry. The views of this presentation do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank <laughs> of Kansas City or the Federal Reserve System. Now you can't get me fired. Now, now, it is my sincere belief, after doing this work for 20 years in some iteration, 30 years in total with community development included, that what you represent is an, meets the inflection point of where we're at in both the American, US, and also global history. The things that you bring to the table, the things that you're grappling with, the things that you're trying to figure out are literally transformative because you're doing something in a way it has never been done before for people who have never been included in that process. And that's power. You are the evolution or the revolution if you want to go back to the tale of two cities. Now, I'm finishing up my PhD. My, my good buddies in Network Kansas were gracious enough to allow me to dig into them and research on relationship formation and entrepreneurship ecosystem building. And going through this process, I've identified four waves of economic development. And you, those of you who are in policy making or in other areas of economic development will pretty rapidly identify this. So the first wave is one we still do today. It's still our dominant form of economic development. It's industrial recruitment. Industrial recruitment basically says we are going to try to reduce the cost of a firm doing business in our community to get them to come. I think somebody early referenced Amazon, right? So we're gonna throw $3 billion or some incentives at you to get you to come and the, economic, the net economic value that you bring to my community will exceed the lower cost of taxes or the other incentives that I give you. So it's a very practical model that originated in the 1930s in the South because they had tremendous trouble with poverty coming out of the various recessions, depressions, wars, and whatever. And they said, we got to figure out a way. It was very practical. It was very logical at the time. And then everybody began to adopt it, so it neutered the impact that it could have in any one community because now everybody's trying to chase people with the same dollars, right? We still do that today. Most people think this entrepreneurship stuff is new. It's not. And in fact, as the economy changed, we had the oil crisis. We had the economic crises that emerged in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, we remember everybody the term Reaganomics and things like that that were happening. High inflation, all this stuff was grappling. And then we had globalism coming on top of that. And poor communities were saying, wait a minute, this industrial attraction model is not working for us. We got to figure something else out. And so then some research came out that said the same thing Victor just said, which was, or I believe it was Andy who said, wow, small businesses create the majority of net new jobs. Everybody started jumping on this. And some of you old school folks remember this. This is where you saw the rise of incubators. 
So incubators really went from zero to 100 in about a decade. You saw state-run venture capital firms. You saw a lot of issues with uh, organizations promoting exporting as a way for small businesses to engage open markets. So that happened. Now that spiked, it peaked, and then it diminished. And then came in something that a lot of you also know, which is cluster-based economic development. So Michael Porter came up with this concept of cluster-based economic development in the 90s, and he said, wait a minute, we really have to look at the, the development, economic development context, right? So we have, to, we have to bring in companies that actually fit what is the competitive advantage of the given community. And so all of these things are happening and still happening at the same time. And then you all came along. Now, while a lot of you originated before 2010, really you started seeing a lot of energy and formalization of the space of ecosystem building in this time period. Now, what makes ecosystem building so unique? What I argue is ecosystem building becomes, is so unique for a few reasons. First of all, you're creatives, you're innovatives, you're decentralizing wealth, you're giving opportunity to others to innovate and create economic mobility for themselves. You're revitalizing economies based upon how entrepreneurs can produce wealth at the local level versus what a major firm is gonna bring into a community. Now, when you put all of that into the mix, what you essentially are doing as ecosystem builders is saying, we believe in community. We believe in people. We believe in power, the power of the people to create something new, to conceive something, believe something, and produce it, and create transformation in their local environment. And that is something that has never happened in the history of America in the formal economic development space. That's why I call you an evolutionary and a revolutionary. Because if you do what you do right, you will change the world. I have no doubt about that. Now, one of the major topics that we've been talking about is diversity and inclusion within this space. And this is vitally important. It's vitally important. I've been talking about this a long time before it became, you know, a normal word within this, the lexicon of ecosystem building. And the point that I used to make back in the day when I was talking about it early on was this. If we don't bake DNI into the recipe of ecosystem building, not the frosting, not as the add-on, if it's not an essential intrinsic element to ecosystem building, what you will do is reinforce the good old boy network that occurred in corporations in the 1980s in the ecosystem world in the 2010s and beyond. And when you do that, what you will actually do is the reverse of what the power of ecosystem building is. So instead of creating an opportunity for all to create wealth and value at the local level based upon their ability to conceive, believe, and ultimately produce value, you will keep that process to a very narrow group of people who are the ones that, by and large, already have the money. Now think about it. When we critique corporations back in 1980s, what are we saying? We have a particular demographic group that has a high level of power, that does deals with themselves, they bring in their own people to do those, and those that don't look like them, think like them, act like them, or located near them, don't get access to that opportunity. And for those of you who heard me speak before, you will recognize this phrase. How's that working for you? Right now, we have one of the highest historical rates of wealth and equity. 40, 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, the wealth gap between blacks and whites is pretty much the same. So where's the promise of Martin Luther King? Right? Where's the promise of all these actions that we had? We have, we have crucified our rural communities, especially our small rural communities, by getting co communities with 500 people trying to recruit major corporations as a solution to that problem. How do you do that? So, so, so you're telling me that Loop City, Nebraska is going to put a, big, a competitive big package in place for Amazon. Loop City has 1,200 people, by the way. It's not going to happen. So we have to eliminate in this field, geographical bias, you ever heard that term? I just made it up. <laughs> Rural geographical bias, personal bias, identity bias, all of these different biases. Because I, before I hit this next and final slide, I want to reference something Victor said last year, and I use it all the time. He said, the problem is we have so many under-optimized entrepreneurs. Not disadvantaged, I don't like that term. Under-optimize. Now, as I begin to conclude, here's why I say under-optimize. Because me, if me and you, right, are 
equally talented, or let's say you're greater talented than me as a woman, but I get the advantages because I'm a man. I get access to the networks, the resources, all of the support. The culture is designed for me, and we're both trying to be entrepreneurs. And as a result, I produce 10 times, but you have the potential to produce 100 times, but you only produce 10 times. The economic loss in that situation is what? 90 times. That's what happens when you exclude people from this process, when you create systems and barriers to this process. Now, finally, we recently released a guy, this is a shameless plug, by the way. Me and Rodney Sampson for OHUD, How to Build Entrepreneurship Ecosystem in Communities of Color. Check that out, it's on our website. But I wanted to shout out these and all the others that have your back. Like, we at the Fed, we have your back. Andy Kaufman have your back. Maria Sorsling have your back. Don Mackey, Energizing Entrepreneurial Communities, Engaged in Network Kansas have your back. OHUB, Rodney Sampson, we have your back. Like Andy says, we're trying to build an ecosystem of ecosystem builders. We love you, we care about you, we want to see the best for you, we want you to do the best, but we want you to do it in the right way. And so if I could give you any call to action, take the seven frameworks seriously, socialize around those, build the fuel, the fuel, the field, Nebraska talk, and go forth and do great work because we're there to backstop you and support you at every level of the way. That's all I got for you, appreciate you, Andy.